Hello everybody, this is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Today I'm uh, continuing my conversations with uh, Brother Jason Jack. Uh, this is a series titled um, 101 Verses Proving Faith Alone. Uh, we've made, uh, I think, five, five or six um, videos already in the series, and they are available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Creature. So just go to that playlist, and I uh, hope you will watch uh, this series from the beginning. Uh, today we're on uh, number 18 on our list, and before we get started, uh, brother, just say hi to everybody, and any opening thoughts you want to Alright, okay, very good then. Let's get started here. Uh, the next verse is Acts 13, 39. So let me paste that into my uh, Bible gateway is, that, is what I'm using. Control B. Alright, so here is Acts 13, 39 in the KJV, and by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Well, brother, that's like, that's a real soft, uh, what is it, a softball? Or a... Yeah, that, that's putting it on key and just, you know, just going at it right there. There's not much to say about that. Okay, uh, yeah, this is one of the great verses that is so clear and, and um, explicit that uh, it should just settle the issue. I mean, there, hey, you, you need just a verse like this and nothing else, and argument should be over. Anybody who uh, can read this verse and still think that uh, faith alone in Christ alone is insufficient. More is required that we've got to contribute uh, for our salvation, like repenting of our sins, changing our lives, uh, getting sin out of our life, all these things that people say um, we must do. Uh, this verse here, well, we've got 101 verses like this, but this one is so explicit. So let's let's break this down. Um, and by the way, this is Acts 13.39. I didn't look at the context of this you're saying Paul is uh, saying this right here? Correct. Okay, so Paul says, and by him, uh, now I'm looking at in the Amplified, and the him is capitalized. Uh, that's, you know, the, the capitalization is the, uh, that's a decision that's made by the Bible translators and the publishers uh, of the various translations. Uh, but the, the, the use of capitalization uh, is it, it tells us that those translators have um, made a capital uh, letter to indicate that this is referring to God. And, uh, and it says, so in the KJV it says, and by him, uh, if we capitalize it, uh, it, it tells us that him is referring to Jesus and it also declares that he's God because it's capitalized. So I think that's worth worth noting. Uh, so, and by him, that's Jesus Christ, uh, the eternal God Almighty, God manifest in the flesh as the Son of God, the only Savior. That's him. And by him, all that believe. Now, first of all, all, 
Um, that that's certainly tells us that uh, uh, refuting Calvinism that uh, uh, only a, a select few uh, can be saved. Uh, but this has all anyone, all, anybody without exception, all that believe, anybody that chooses to put their faith in Jesus uh, are justified. Now, uh, belief, of course, we talked about this in some of the other earlier verses. Uh, I believe it means that you are, you're putting your faith in Jesus. You're believing in him, in his ability to save you, in his faithfulness to keep the promise uh, of eternal life. Uh, and uh, uh, you're believing on him, as it says uh, in Acts 1631 says believe on the Lord so that to me means that you're depending on him you're relying on him so from the beginning again and by him by Jesus Christ any person all any person that will believe or rely on Jesus are justified now justified sometimes people want to argue about uh, you know the difference between justified and uh, and saved and but justified means saved, in my opinion. It means justified. Uh, a clever way of uh, expressing it is just as if I'd never sinned. So God sees you, brother, as just as just as if you had never sinned. After you put your faith in Jesus, that's how God sees you. You've never sinned. Uh, and it says justified from all things. I mean... It, 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 there's no way out of this. All things, every sin that you've ever done, every sin that you might do in the future, uh, as uh, I don't remember where Paul states it, but not, nothing, uh, either height nor depth or nothing, there's no way, or, uh, nothing that could possibly ruin your salvation. So this is another time Paul is saying, uh, look, it's all things are covered. And then he says, by which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. So uh, he's not only saying you're saved by faith alone and Christ alone, and you're completely saved. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> you're justified from all things. But then he, he does what Paul always does. That I, I think that separates Paul from uh, the, the, the others. <coughs> Jesus, Peter, and John all say that uh, you're saved by believing. And then Paul adds, and not only that, the law could never save you and don't add the law to it. So here in this verse, Paul covers every, all the bases. He says, and from, from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. <clears throat> so whether it's the law of Moses that was given to Israel or whether it's, um, the, uh, the law of, of, uh, right and wrong, the conscience that's written in our heart for the Gentiles, uh, it doesn't matter, uh, all, all condemnation is is uh, is covered, and but it could not be covered by your own efforts to follow any kind of legalist system. Um, all right, so uh, I'm going to read it in the Amplified, but I want you to just respond to anything else you want to say about that verse, uh, the, or or respond to what I said. Yeah, I think you covered it very well. The two um, times that it mentions the word all, I think are very important to know that all that believe, so everyone past, present, and future who believe on Jesus Christ are justified from all things past, present, and future. Uh, so it, it's covering all people and all sins, and that is summarized in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that's exactly what it's uh, discussing here, and like you said, it not only shows what saves you, but justifies you, but it also shows what doesn't. And just like the first verse that we spent a whole hour on at the beginning of this, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it shows that by grace are you saved through faith, and then not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works. So it shows what saves you, Jesus Christ, and faith in him, and him alone, and what doesn't save you. And that's the works of the law, mm -hmm. the law of Moses. You can't be justified by that. So this verse is, is great in that sense of showing both sides of what can save you and what doesn't save you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to read it in the Amplified before we 
go to the next verse. It says, and through him, the him is capitalized, everyone who believes, that is, who acknowledges Jesus as Lord and Savior and follows him. Okay, here's where we can have a, a dispute with the amplified uh, translators here. Uh, they've, they've inserted their own thoughts on this, and, and I would not put these thoughts in here because they're, they're, uh, they're uh, basically um, giving uh, uh, people the, the impression that uh, believing in him means not only you acknowledge him as your savior, but also as Lord, and you must follow him. Now, Jesus is Lord. Now, by the way, the Lord uh, in, uh, in the, the epistles, the, the word Lord is kurios, K-U-R-I-O-S. And that's, uh, that, that always means Lord in the sense that it, it's God. Um, rather than Lord in the terms, uh, in the sense that, uh, like uh, Sarah called um, Abraham Lord, not saying that he was God, but he's, he's her master and, and, and whatever he does, she's going to submit to it. Uh, so when people see the word Lord here, they assume that it's uh, uh, meaning that, oh, you've got to follow, submit, and serve him as your Lord and master. Uh, but that's not the, the Greek word that we find in this, in, in, in when it says Lord. And then they also add, and follows him. So here the Amplified absolutely fails, and it, they're exposed here of, of having this uh, Lordship uh, works uh, um, a mindset that they're inserting in here. Um, and then it says, is justified and declared free of guilt from all things from which you could not be justified and freed of guilt through the law of Moses. Uh, so I, I imagine you have the same uh, grievance that, that I would have expressed here against this amplified translation on this verse. Yeah, adding, the, adding and follow, um, you know, is, is beginning to mix discipleship with salvation and what we should do as followers of Christ after receiving the Holy Spirit promise to faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, the two don't mix. If you try to mix the two, then you're looking at yourself, you're looking at what you're doing instead of what Christ did, and you're confusing and muddying the gospel. Um, so, you know, I like your position of King James first. I'm more of a King James only because of a situation like this, but we have certainly seen so many great amplifications through the Amplified Bible that give incredible further description of the truths of the Bible here, we see where we would not agree with it amplification. You know, it, it's um, um, you know looking at this verse and and you know, I mean, you're doing conversation conversational um, on this verse. This is adding to it, and so you know that's why I still tend to be picture the only because of situ situations like this. Now, somebody that has, and, and when I say the scripture, you know, when I, when I, refer, I refer, I'm referring to the King James Bible when I say scripture and not modern translations or anything like that. And I believe that we just simply need the scripture and the Holy Spirit, which indwells believers, that God says into understanding of God's word. And that's all you need. You don't need any other Bible that elaborates on it, you don't need other people's commentaries, because you don't really know if the people who are commentating are even saved or not. You know, you just truly don't know unless you know them personally and they have witness to you and they tell you, the, you know, what they believe is the true gospel. Otherwise, you really don't know. Um, but, with that said, looking at um, other Bible versions, if you are grounded and settled in the Word of God and have the Holy Spirit, then you can easily see when these type of situations come about, and you can discern it well. Just like you read that, and I, I, could, I could see, even though I'm not looking at you, I could see you immediately, when that word follow came up, I could see you mentally all of a sudden hesitate and say, whoa, 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 something is not right here. This is not what Scripture says, and so let's talk about it more. 
So I think just showing this and pointing this out is a great exercise in and of itself. Mm -hmm. um, so that's awesome. Yeah. So um, um, let me let me talk a little bit more about this KJV only and, and KJV first uh, uh, statements here. The, um, I do believe uh, I look at KJV only as as my test of scripture. So uh, I'm not looking at the Amplified or any other translation as scripture. I look at all other translations as commentary. Hey, Luke, can you hear me? I can't hear you. Uh, yeah, you can't hear me now. Hello. Hello. Hmm. I wonder, are you are you still there, brother? I'm gonna hang up and call you. Yeah, can you hear me now? Okay, I'm gonna hang up on him and call him right back. All right, that's the first time I've lost a call. From hopefully, if this redial here will uh, get everything working right again. Hey. Uh, can you hear me this time? I can hear you now. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know what happened. I lost it yeah. I, I don't know. I, I continued hearing you, but you were not responding to my voice. So, okay, we're back yeah. fixed here. So let me just repeat the last thought before I think you you uh, you lost my audio, uh, and that is that. Um, I do use the KJV as my scripture. It's I test everything against the KJV, uh, and uh, for some of the reasons I mentioned earlier, because there are some really important verses that are in the KJV that we don't find in modern translations. But it's also uh, this is another example of why you need to test it against the KJV, and also test it against just the doctrines that we've we've um, uh, settled on that. Through study, um, this 101 verses is, is uh, a great way to uh, uh, establish this doctrine to see that not only uh, do we see the, the doctrine that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and no religious works are required on our part to get saved, to stay saved, or to prove one is truly saved. So we, once we see that the, ver the Bible says this over and over again clearly, uh, and we've settled on it, now we, 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 but we bring that doctrine wherever we go. And, and, and every time we see a verse that, that uh, contradicts that in any way, whether it's clearly contradicting or whether it's a little bit uh, uh, foggy on it, and you have to be a little concerned how it's expressing it. This one is that nothing but you know, alarm bells go off as I re read that verse. Uh, uh, acknowledge that Jesus as Lord and Savior. See, when people say Lord and Savior, it's not necessarily the wrong thing. Uh, if, if I if I say Jesus is my God and Savior, that, that's certainly a valid point. Uh, that's how I see the word Lord here. Uh, but if I think, if I see that uh, Jesus is my Lord which means he's my master and I serve him completely as, and follow him uh, and surrender my life over to him. And this is part of what's needed or required for me to be saved. Then, then all of a sudden we say, well, heresy, damnable heresy. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the KJV and, and, and the doctrine of uh, faith alone for salvation is um, what we test everything against. And and then when we read a verse like this in the Amplified or the NIV or any other translation or a commentary or a conversation with a, a, a brother, um, oh, everything has to be tested against that doctrine. And uh, and now what you're doing, um, it, it, I, by the way, many, many years ago, I was reading uh, a commentary on a break from work. I would... Um, in the workplace, I'm on a break and I'm reading. And a brother comes up to me and says, what are you reading? And I told him. And he says, oh, no, you don't do that. Don't read anything except the Bible. I'm saying, you mean, I, I, you, you think that I should not read any commentaries on the Bible or any books written about the Bible? Uh, no, just the Bible only. 
And I, I said, well, if, if the person that wrote the commentary, uh, was not, had not written it, but was sitting at the table here with me now and having a conversation and giving me their thoughts on the Bible, uh, are you saying that I should say, oh, I can't have a conversation with you? Uh, because whether they did it verbally, expressed it verbally with me in person, or whether they wrote it down and published it in a book, it's still that person's comments and thoughts. So uh, if I took his uh, line of uh, reasoning there, uh, I should, I cannot even have any conversation with any person about the Bible because it's extra biblical. And so uh, uh, this conversation I'm having with you now, and, and uh, you, when you're expressing your thoughts and I'm expressing my thoughts, if a person goes to that extreme, that no, only the Bible, only the KJV, then we, we conversations have to end. It has to be only the Bible and only the Holy Spirit and us alone, and we might as well just go into a monastery and be a monk and, and not even communicate with anybody. Yeah, when I, you know, when I mentioned we don't need commentaries and like that, I mean, we don't need it. But we can certainly use it and, and have those conversations. But we... Here's what I did wrong several thousand years ago. I started reading books about the Bible instead of just picking up and reading the Bible itself. And I, I wasn't regenerated, and I was learning a lot of good things, and I was hearing what man had to say about the Bible, but I wasn't picking up the Word of God and reading it and let the living Word of God tell me, you know, what is and what isn't and, and guide me into understanding and to acknowledging of the truth and accepting Jesus Christ as my Savior. And it wasn't until I did that that I became a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Then I continued to read and gain maturity and, as, as a Christian and became grounded and settled in the Word of God and the different doctrines and understanding it because of the interconnectedness and I could see how the end of the Bible and the middle of the Bible tied into the beginning of the Bible and it all points to Jesus. And then after that, if I pick up a, a commentary, if I pick up, you know, if I have a conversation with somebody else, if I watch another video or another preacher or pick up a book, and I wrote a book, <laughs> you know, so that would be very hypocritical if I said Jesus absolutely can't read anything other than the Bible, uh, because I wrote a book that I hope people read because it points directly to Jesus Christ. But again, be grounded and settled in Scripture, and then use that to be edified and gain, you know, more understanding through the edification that comes with talking with others, hearing other people. Uh, thoughts and, and things like that. If they align with scripture, then of course we should accept them and embrace them. If they don't, then simply reject them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good point that uh, here you are an author and you wrote a book about the Bible and about salvation in Jesus and, uh, and uh, uh, if people had the attitude that, well, we can't even read his book because it's extra biblical, just only read the scriptures, uh, then uh, they're missing out because um, your your thoughts on it uh, may be very helpful to some people. And I'm um, sure, matter of fact, I'm, I can say they certainly will be very helpful to many people who, if they read your book. Um, so this is just an, like an, an, another example of how people take an idea that might be pretty good uh, and, and then they go to the extreme with it. Like the idea, of course, that's good is, okay, the KJV is our Bible and we, uh, we, it's our scriptures and uh, that's what we rely upon for the truth and, and um, don't read anything apart from that. Uh, including any commentaries or books by Jack Smack or Jason Jack or anybody else, uh, that would be taking it a step too far. Uh, because they're, the, these commentaries, and that's why I'm saying, that when I'm looking at this Amplified, uh, look at all the times it's been very, very good and said, oh, wow, it really did a great job on that. 
But we have enough discernment and we're grounded uh, so securely in the, the true doctrine of the free gift salvation that uh, we, we can identify these things instantly. This, as I said, like uh, uh, alarms just go off immediately when we see that, wait a second, they're, they're wrong on this. And it's not a minor error, it's a damnable error. Okay? Uh, all right, anything else before I go to the next verse? No, that's good. Okay, brother. The next one is Romans 8, 7. Uh, in KJV, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Hmm. Okay, I'm glad you get to go first on this, brother. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Doing that, 
then you're getting back under the law, which never saves anybody. So I think that's why this is here, uh, just to show that dichotomy between the, the carnal man and the spiritual man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, here and, and also in uh, in First Corinthians, we can see how Paul talks quite a bit about car, uh, the carnal man. And in fact, not only are we carnal before we get saved, but even after we get saved, we we're still carnal. And this is I have a video of uh, uh, carnal Christians question uh, mark because there are people who say that. A Christian cannot be carnal, and it, it's, I don't understand how um, uh, if they've read the person who's read the Bible could ever make such a crazy statement. Uh, because Paul refers to the Corinthian church in his letter uh, as they're they're babes in Christ, so that he's he's talking to people who are saved but they're not mature, uh, and, and and he calls them carnal. So. The, all, the whole church or much of that church population, are, their lives are very carnal. And But Paul then confesses that even he is carnal. And, and, and he makes quite a con confession about, about his life and his struggle with the flesh, uh, the old man and the, the new man. Uh, so knowing that, uh, how could anybody think that there's no such thing as a carnal Christian? We're, we're all, we're all, we are all carnal. It's only a question of degrees, and it's only a question of how obvious it is as we observe each other's lives. Some people are very obviously carnal, and some people are, uh, it's, it's more secret, uh, secret sin, secret carnal lives that we live. And, uh, um, yeah, so I guess, uh, that's really the point of this whole chapter. And, uh, I, I think you talked quite a bit about chapter 8 and chapter 9 in one of our, of our previous videos. Uh, all right, anything else before we move on? No, let's go to the next one. Okay, so this is Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Let me paste that in here. Okay, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I gave you my dramatic rendition of that. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, brother. Uh, we know that this is one of the go-to verses for lordship salvation is to support their uh, damnable heresy. Uh, but uh, this is actually a go-to verse for us to, to prove their that their the, their doctrine is a damnable heresy. So go ahead. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's that's amazing, isn't it? That you, you know we obviously see this and for what it is, this hypothetical situation of somebody being at the judgment seat of Christ and professing how great they are and how many good, wonderful works they've done, and then Jesus says, "I never knew you the part for me, work or iniquity." You know, work iniquity. And again, work is mentioned twice in verses 22 and 23. Um, but yet, you'll have a voice of salvation that will twist this verse upside down on its head and point to this, saying, if you don't do the works, you're not going to heaven. And it is truly amazing how somebody that does not have their faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, how spiritually blind they can be to not see what this verse is saying. Um, so, you know, you go back to verse 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, that he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Well, what's the will of the Father, you know, when I saw this, and what's the salvation we're using this to justify, you know, this backdoor workplace salvation, and this change life salvation, uh, and if you don't think Lord of all, he's not the Lord at all, and all this nonsense, when it comes to salvation, of course that's stuff that we should do, but that's discipleship, and they mix the two, and it cancels grace, and, you know, the, makes the cross of none effect. But if you go to John 6, um, it tells you what the will of the Father is, and it says, verse 38 through 40, for I came down from 
heaven. This is Jesus speaking, not to be my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise them up at the last day. So the will of the Father is to acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Savior, believe on him, and then rest in eternal life that he gives you as a free gift. Uh, believe the record, as it says in 1 John 5, 10 through 13. And this is the record that Jesus is the Son of God, and God for your sins, and those who believe have eternal life will just believe in that. Uh, but yet they will want to mix their uh, works and their efforts and their changed life, quote, changed life that they've had since their, quote, spiritual rebirth and look at their faithfulness and their obedience instead of Jesus' perfect faithfulness and obedience and try to justify themselves through their actions. Um, and again, it, it turns the gospel upside down. It confuses many people. And, um, you know, again, the Word of God is quick and powerful and tougher than any two edged sword. It goes on in Hebrews 4 12, and as the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Well, this is one of those passages that truly discerns the thoughts and intents of the heart. Um, this will tell me very quickly. If somebody is discerning through the Spirit the Word of God correctly, or if they are putting it on their head, um, so this is this is a good verse that that can point that out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, very well said. Um, you know, we we talked uh, in earlier videos about uh, principles of Bible study, principles of establishing our doctrine. And, and to me, the top of the list is uh, we, we should draw our conclusions based upon clear verses, not ambiguous verses. And we should uh, and, uh, reinforce that if the clear verses, the point is repeated over and over again in many verses. So the doctrine of salvation by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone is expressed explicitly. And it's expressed repeatedly. So to me, uh, that settles it. That's the truth. Uh, and, and then uh, we look at all the other verses. We must look at it through that lens and see, does this contradict it? If, if it seems to contradict it, then may, we must be understanding it incorrectly. So let's, let's delve deeper. And that brings us to the second point of Bible um, uh, principle of Bible study in formulating your doctrines. And that is the principle of context. And, and for this, uh, the context is right in front of our nose if we just back up a few verses. Let's go back to verse 15. Uh, Jesus says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Now, uh, Jesus' warning, beware of false prophets, false teachers. Uh, and, and it says, you shall know them by their fruits. Now, there, here's another verse, verse 16. You shall know them by their fruits. Uh, Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Uh, so this verse here is also used by the Lordship heretics uh, to teach that uh, your life must bear really good fruit to prove that you're truly saved. And yet they don't, they, they might as well just take an eraser and erase verse 15, which just tells us that the, the fruit verses are referring back to the false prophets. It's not referring to uh, a person who's saved. It's referring to a false prophet, a false teacher, like a lordship teacher, like MacArthur, Piper, Washer, Comfort. Uh, these are the false prophets that this verse is warning us about. And, and uh, the fruit uh, that they are, are uh, bearing is uh, uh, false converts, people who are not truly getting saved because 
uh, they're believing the wrong thing. They're believing that you're saved by changing your life and bearing good fruit. Uh, so this very verse is warning us about them. And, and then when we go forward to the verse where our uh, subject of, of our talk here is, it says this, this verse is connected to the previous thought. So it is talking about the false prophets uh, teaching the false doctrine, the false uh, damnable, uh, uh, what is it, the, the, the gospel that's not really a, the gospel. It says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord. Now these, what, what do the Lordship salvationists say? They're saying, Lord, to me, this verse here is 21, uh, 22. Jesus says, many will say to me in that day. Now, what day is he referring to? He's talking about the judgment day. Now, brother, you're not going to go before the Lord and have to plead your case for your salvation uh, because uh, you're saved and uh, Jesus recognizes you. Uh, he doesn't have to say, I never knew you. He'll recognize you uh, as someone who's saved because you put your faith in him instead of your and your faith in your own ability to do good works. So you and I are going to go to the judgment seat of Christ be, uh, because we are Christ. We belong to him. We're saved. We're Christians. And we're going to go to get judged for our ministries to see how many uh, rewards we get for our good works, not to determine if we're even going to go to heaven. But so this, this point here in verse 22, many will say to me in that day, that's referring to the, the unbelievers, the people who are lost. Uh, they go be to the, uh, the uh, great white throne judgment where all the unbelievers go to. And some people are going to go to that judgment and they're going to be pleading their case. And they're, this is the plea that they're going to make. Lord, Lord, um, um, uh, have we not prophesied in thy name? And thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. So these people who are not saved, uh, who are putting their faith in their own works, they go to this judgment, and they plead their case based upon their own works. And and because of that, uh, they are lost. Uh, they are, if, if you had to plead your case, and you don't, you don't have to plead your case, because... Uh, as I said, when we go to the judgment seat of Christ, our salvation is already determined. We don't have to go there and, or, you know, argue our, our case. Uh, but the lost people, uh, they're going to be there pleading for their lives, for their, for their salvation. And their, their plea is going to be wrong because they never had their faith in Jesus. Their faith was only in their ability to do good works. And that's what this is telling us. This verse is saying there are going to be people that never put their faith in Jesus, but instead put their faith in uh, their ability to uh, make Jesus their Lord and Master and do good works. And, and then they taught this to other people. And they were the false prophets, the false teachers, and many other people are going to be lost because of them. And that's the bad fruit that they're going to bear, lost followers. Uh, so Jesus answers them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. The, the work of iniquity that they're doing is works salvation. Um, all right, brother, I'm, there's quite a bit to that, but uh, I tried to emphasize that, that we need to back up a few verses to get the context so we can understand this correctly. Why don't the Lordship people back up and see the context in, of these verses? So this is 
Matthew 7 is a warning against false prophets that will come to you and say this lordship salvation kind of teaching where they're mixing the true gospel with their own self-righteousness. And it's not the gospel. That's a false gospel. That's an accursed gospel. And Matthew 7 is warning you about this. And the results of what the preachers and pastors who teach this false gospel, what the fruits are, is not fruits of righteousness. Um, you know, it's, it's false converts, like you said. And then they teach others. And then they produce false converts. So that's the fruit in Matthew 7, uh, not works of righteousness. Yeah, it is. It, it, I find it really fascinating that the, the the things that clearly save, that uh, we're saved by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone, that those are those verses are being used to uh, pervert the gospel and and uh, support the false teaching of lordship salvation. Like when you reference the uh, the will of the Father. There, there's take that verse, which which tells us to be saved, we need to do the will of the Father, which is as you cited in John, it's explained that the will of the Father is uh, is to believe on the Son. Uh, that's what the will of the Father is. That's what we must do to be saved. But they want to make the will of the Father following the, the, all the laws of Moses. Uh, they don't back up and look. Well, what does it mean, the will of the Father? If they were to look it up and find out what the meaning of that is, they wouldn't be uh, you know, able to make such false claims. Um, and in here, this verse, these verses about uh, the Lord, Lord, uh, it's saying it's saying that the, Jesus is telling us the truth, and it's obvious. But then they don't back up and, and find out. Well, what does he really mean by this? All they need to do is get the context. Look. The, what I'm finding interesting here also is this uh, amplified translation. In the last verse, we showed how they were uh, misinterpreting it. And in this verse, let's see what they do with it. It says in verse 15, I'm going to start there. It says, beware of the false prophets. And they insert teachers. Uh, who, that's good. I agree with that. Who come to you dressed as sheep. Uh, uh, they insert appearing gentle and innocent. But inwardly are ravenous wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. And they insert this. That is, by their contrived doctrine and self-focus. That's exactly how you and I would describe it. And so here they are correct, saying that this fruit is this contrived doctrine and focusing on self. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it does one of two things. It's either one, the person realizes that they're a sinner and they can't keep the law like these false prophets are telling them that they have to, and they just throw their hands in the air and give up, and it gives Christianity a bad name, or they think that they can keep the law and they become self-righteous and prideful. Either way, it's not saving anyone. <laughs> and so that, I, I like that amplification there uh, of that verse. Because you're exactly right. That is what the ravening wolves are inwardly. They're self-righteous, false prophets. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're trusting in themselves and not on Jesus Christ. Yeah. I mean, how could the Amplified Translators be so right in this case and in many other cases that we've discussed earlier in earlier videos and then in the, the previous verse, so clearly uh, teaching a damnable heresy. It's an, I don't I don't get that. Uh, well, man is fallible. Yeah. And God is infallible, and and the true word of God, you know, is inspired, completely inspired. And the modern translations have a a little bit of um, interpretation of man that may or may not be inspired. You know, this may be a collaboration where, you know, the amplified version was 
translated and interpreted by dozens of people. And, you know, it may be in the last verse that there was somebody that had a hint of worship salvation coming into their doctrine and interpreted uh, the last verse or a couple of verses back uh, like that and adding the word following where you get that sense that you need to be a disciple and a good disciple and follow Christ and that's part of it. Uh, that's not part of salvation. That's part of discipleship. So I think that, again, it's just, you know, men are fallible and we're not going to interpret it uh, right. And me and you just went through every verse of the Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. I'm going to fall short on many interpretations, especially as it gets deeper into the meat of Scripture and especially eschatology and things like that that we, you know, can can only try to, uh, to do our best on exactly how all that is going to come about. But as far as it comes to the gospel, you know, I think we're very clear uh, on that uh, because we have the Holy Spirit that guides us. I say that, you know, not to boast, but out of humility. You know, I can't do anything on my own and in the flesh. It's all of the Spirit. Uh, just being led and, and staying humble and allowing the Spirit to God into understanding. And I know that I'm wrong uh, from time to time. And, you know, I'm constantly learning and using the, the Spirit and Scripture to, to guide me into understanding passages and, and books and chapters better. Um, but uh, the inspired Word of God, there's no errors in that. It, it is infallible. So that's why I hope we should, can and should fall back to, um, you know, Scripture for uh, the truth. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, we're getting close to an hour, but I think we can squeeze with this one more verse in. Uh, John, John 10, 1. Uh, Jesus, these are in red letters, so these are, uh, these words are ascribed to Jesus speaking them. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. Mm. And that goes with John 14, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Right here in John 10, 1. And he goes on later in the passage to define what this door is. It's him. <laughs> uh, John 10, 7, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. And then goes in John 10, 9, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out by pasture. So this is discussing how to receive the love of God, God's grace, God's mercy, and eternal life is through the Son, it's through the door. And it's as easy as opening a door. But there's only one door, and that's Jesus Christ and my faith in Him. And if you try to do it your way and open other doors and think that's going to lead to the Father, then the same as a thief and a robber, it's not going to work out. There's going to be condemnation in that, uh, you know, because there's only one way to the Father, and it's through the Son. And so that's what he said. Jesus is explaining uh, here that he is the door. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, th there are a lot of people that um, object to the uh, Christian claim that uh, you, you only Christians go to heaven. That's the only way to get to heaven. Um, and yet, uh, the Bible says over and over again, particularly from Jesus' own words, he repeats over and over again, that uh, he is the only way. And that, uh, so this, the exclusivity of Jesus is, is uh, and uh, integral, um, is, is essential part of our faith that uh, 
And that, that's why when we understand that and believe that, uh, then we should feel we really feel obligated to spread the gospel and tell people about this only way. Because the people who, who don't go through this door, Jesus Christ, uh, they're lost and they're doomed. And uh, we have the key to that door. And, and uh, um, if we don't tell people about it, then shame on us. Uh, so um, if people don't like the fact that Jesus is the only way, then that's unfortunate for them. But uh, in, instead of being... I, I have always felt that instead of being upset that, well, why is there only one way? It's not right. It's not fair that there's only one way. Well, instead of being upset that there's only one way, why don't we just thank Jesus that he did provide a way? Because before them, before he provided the way, there was no way. <laughs> now at least there is a way, but there's only one, and it's Jesus. Um, let me read this in the Amplified. They insert something here I want to get your thought on. It says, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up some other place, and they insert on the stone wall, that one is a thief and a robber. What is this stone wall that they, uh, they're referencing here, you think? KJV, it just simply says, but climbeth up some other way, uh, and they insert uh, uh, climbs uh, from some other place on the stone wall. Um, I'm not sure how they, that you might be right uh, there. I could see how you could, uh, um, uh, what is that, when you, uh, you kind of allegorize it you know, like that, uh, the um, to me, when I see stone, immediately I start thinking of the commandments, uh, the, the commandments written in stone. So uh, I could say that, hey, the other way that they're trying to do it is by following the commandments. Um, um, so I'm not sure how why they said that or not, but uh, um, you did kind of open up another can of worms, and I wanted to end this now, but I think I we we ought to take a minute to talk about it. We're... 59 minute, minutes and 25 seconds now, so <laughs> that's all right. And, and that is this parable of the sower. Um, I, uh, early on in my Bible readings, uh, I, I, I thought that the the four uh, types of soil, um, of the four, only the fourth one was saved. Um and a lot of people see it that way, particularly Lordship Salvation as people, they, they'll say that if you're, uh, uh, if you're on shallow ground or thorny soil, these are people who didn't truly get saved. And the fact that they didn't grow and mature just proves that they were never truly saved. 
But um, the way I interpret that uh, story now is, is that um, all were saved except the first one. And that's because in the shallow ground and the thorny soil, the seed did spring to life. And that's what being born again is. We get, we, we're, our spirit is brought to life. We're regenerated, we're quickened, uh, we're born again. And, but then once we're spiritually brought to life, what happens between that moment and our last breath uh, varies. And, and uh, uh, you have examples. It's the three examples uh, that, of, the, that the people, do, their spirit was brought to life, the seed sprung to life, uh, you have some that um, don't live very long and don't, don't grow, and, and, and others that live for a while and then they're choked away, and then others that live and then they grow and multiply and produce a lot of uh, fruits. That's just examples of uh, various types of Christians and, and how well they mature um, and how productive they are as Christians. Um, so I, I, I see now that the one seed that fell by the wayside of the people who didn't listen and didn't, didn't um, uh, receive the word and get saved. And the other three uh, types as various types of Christians, they all got saved, but not all were productive uh, fruit pr producers in terms of, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, getting out and uh, serving the Lord, particularly in evangelism, spreading the word so that more people would get saved. Um, I didn't really understand it, what you're saying about uh, your interpretation. Are you in agreement with me on that, or you, you see those seeds differently? No, no, complete agreement. Yeah, three of the four. And I wrote a chapter in my book just covering the parable of the sower and, and went through it looking at Matthew, Mark, and Luke's account and putting those uh, together. There's mainly... Um, you know, similarities, but there's a few differences and, and, you know, a little bit more elaboration, for instance, in the book of Luke that Matthew doesn't say. And, um, so one of my chapters in the book is about that. And I uh, came to the conclusion that three, you know, the, the, um, three of the four are saved. Two of the four, you know, the first one that fell by the wayside, they never received the word of God. Um, so they were saved. But the, the other two in the middle there that everybody has sort of the, are they saved or are they not saved? Yeah, they're saved. They just didn't go on to do what they should be doing to be pleasing to God and be profitable to, to others. They didn't go on and mature as a Christian where that they could evangelize and share the gospel to others. Uh, that's what the good soul does. That's what the... You know, the 30-fold, 50-fold, 100-fold is, that, that's how many people you're sharing the gospel with and that are believing on Jesus Christ, you know, once you share the gospel with them. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I'd say that you're uh, that good soil, and the question is, are you 30, 60, or 100? Uh, by the time you're personal evangelism is finished and your books are written and read and your YouTube videos are watched, uh, you may very well be the hundredfold uh, uh, seed. Uh, I hope that uh, the viewers will uh, get your book and once you tell them the name and, and how they can get your, your, your book before we finish it. Yeah, the book is titled In Spirit and Truth, The Seeker's Path to Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, finished it at the end of last year. It was published around Thanksgiving. It's on Amazon.com. That's probably the best way to get it online. Uh, you can go to Barnes & Noble or Booksamillion.com. Any one of those. It's on eBooks. You know, for less than 10 bucks, you can get it. About 35 to 40% of it is pure scripture. King James Bible scripture and me basically discussing it uh, like we're doing today. Okay, all right, great, brother. Uh, all right, so uh, this will end the, the video for today. And uh, what number are we on? Let me see. Uh, okay, we did number 21.
So we've got uh, 79 more verses to go through on this series. Um, all right, why don't you just give me, take a minute and summarize uh, your thoughts on the study today, and then we'll, we'll close it off. Yeah, today was a lot of good verses. It showed a lot of verses uh, on faith alone, but also that it's not a work. You know, we spent a good bit of time on Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23, and then discussed it in context with false prophets. Um, and that led into John 10, 1, where Jesus uh, discusses uh, that he is the door, and, um, and only by him, can, can somebody receive eternal life? It's only through Him. Uh, and you mentioned, you know, well, some people may say, well, why can't it be another way? But, you know, and, and what about other doors? And, you know, I mentioned what it says. You go, you try to go through another door, then you're a thief and a robber, as it says uh, in John 10. But what we also must rest assured in as Christians is that speaking of Matthew 7, Earlier, right before it starts mentioning about false prophets, it says in verse 7, Ask and it shall be given you, speak and ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. So the gospel will be presented to somebody who is seeking God, no matter where they are. And no matter what color skin they are or what ethnicity or what gender, if you are truly seeking God, the gospel will be delivered. And that's been true since the beginning of creation. Um, and it'll be true until the day of the Lord. And so instead of worrying about if there's other ways and our other faithful in heaven, we must trust the word of God and the truth of the Bible that Jesus is the only way, but then rest assured that Somebody that is truly seeking God will find him through the gospel in the person of Jesus Christ. Um, our job as believers is to tell others the way, the truth, and the life and point others to Jesus Christ and that it's by faith alone so that others won't get mixed up into believing that there's more than one way or that they are part of their own salvation and that Jesus isn't good enough, which a lot of people teach. That, there, that there's God's part, but there's also man's parts of salvation. We have to do the work. Um, so these verses, you know, really hit home on what salvation is and how to receive it, how to receive that free gift of eternal life, and that is through faith in Jesus Christ alone and not of ourselves, not of works. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, all right, I was... Uh... Very much appreciate you uh, joining me in the, these discussions, and I look forward to the next one. So, to the viewers, um, it should be abundantly clear in each of these videos that uh, uh, you can go to heaven if you want to. Uh, if that, if you don't want to, that's fine. God's not going to force you to go to heaven. Uh, he's not going to force you to receive the free gift of salvation, but it's available to you and everyone. Without exception, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever means any person without exception. And the Bible says this salvation is a free gift. It's offered to you. Just believe on Jesus. Rely on Jesus entirely. Uh, dismiss and reject the whole idea that being religious and, and trying to get to heaven through your own righteousness, your own efforts, your own merit. Reject that. That is foolhardy, and it's uh, doomed to failure. And instead, put your faith completely in the person of Jesus. He's our Savior God, and put your faith in what he's done for you. He died for your sins on that cross. Your sins are paid for, and he rose from the dead bodily to prove that he is God and Savior. He does have the power over life and death, and he offers you life everlasting as a free gift. I hope you'll receive it now. Thank you for watching. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.